Uh, that's, by the, the way, that's exactly what my classroom looks like. All out to, war dedicated to the glory to of God. Right okay, so um, my students, they, they come in, they um, have this, you know, great desk. Um, they're, you know, the, they're, they're wearing um, either dresses or nice suits. Um, everyone is completely engaged with the teacher. Um, there are no distractions out there. And I mean, this is just, this is just what education is. Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. Mr. Terry's I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. Now I started this channel not just to learn about history for my own interests, but also uh, to help me be a better history teacher. I'm a high school history teacher and I love to be able to know cool side things about history, cool facts and stuff that of course I can then relay in my classroom and get kids more interested and hopefully find something for everybody when it comes to history. And... Uh, one of the most interested things that, of course, uh, my, my young students are often into is military history and knowing about specific, you know, battles and wars and all that. And uh, anytime I can relay information about that, I think that's a good information because if it interests them, then hopefully they get into more, you know, history. And just uh, war is such a, a brutal thing that is such an ingrained part of history that it's pretty much impossible to separate from history. So anyway, today on that subject, um, we are going to be watching the video that won this week's patrons poll. And it fits in perfectly with this topic because it is called The Most Brutal War in History. Now, this is by the Infographic Show, one of the big heavyweights of educational entertainment on the internet. They do a great job. And uh, I'm excited to check this out. So I don't know what war they're talking about if they're going to talk about just a war or a battle i don't know if it's more modern or more ancient so i don't know what they're going to bring up are they going to go mongol siege of baghdad world war ii crusades i mean gall you can make a huge list here so interested to see what they have put and uh we'll see if uh how it matches up to Maybe other wars and battles that we learn about. Anyway, the original video link is down below. Hopefully your subbed infographic show really is an amazing uh, channel, especially educationally. Um, gives uh, great historical stories and stuff like that. And I love coming back to it again and again. And thanks, uh, you patrons, on voting on this video. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. One. All right, got my helmet on because we're going to war. I always try to be prepared. Um, even if it is a video, I just, I just feel more comfortable doing that. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, first frame. We got like a, a castle or something. So we might be going back in the past a little bit. That's cool. Let's do it. It was the most brutal war in history. Countless lives were lost. Entire Crusades. cities reduced to rubble. Christendom waged war on Islam. Members of the two religions slaughtered each other in some of the most bloody battles in history. The Crusades lasted almost 200 years and would have lasting effects on Europe and the Middle East to this day. Hey, it's me. There I am. Really? My hair gets sweaty from the helmet. All right, they're going Crusades. Interesting with Crusades, because Crusades is not really a war. I mean, it's a bunch of things, uh, these handful events that happened over, again, a couple centuries. So I don't to call it, like, a war, per se, because it's a bunch of different people, multiple generations. You know, but... That, that's just semantics there. Let's get to the Crusades. This was an all-out war dedicated to the glory of God and reclaiming the holy... Uh, that's, by the, the way, that's exactly what my classroom looks like. All-out war dedicated to the glory of right God. Right. Okay, so um, my students, they, they come in. They um, have this, you know, great desk. Um, they're, you know, the, they're, they're wearing um, either dresses or nice suits. Um, everyone is completely engaged with the teacher. Um, there are no distractions out there. And I mean, this is just, this is just what education is. And reclaiming the Holy Land. The just Crusades bad. is the name given to the series of campaigns Christians carried out to reclaim the Holy Land from the Muslim empires. It's important to note that both religions view this area of the world as holy and sure. important to their religion because sure. they worship the same God. They also share... Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming they'll get to all the reasons for the Crusades. A lot of it's territorial. I mean, controlling this region is huge. Um, this area had been in Christian hands, if you want to call it, from the 
uh, traditional Roman Empire to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. And the Crusades really kind of began as the Byzantine Empire lost its hold on um, this region. And their calls for the West um, under trying to, have a ban- uh, trying to get a banner of Christ- European Christianity, which was completely fractured, right? There was no Christian unity and uh, bringing that in. So a lot of it, of course, is territorial. Many of the same prophets, but the Crusades were fought in the name of the same God on both sides. So perhaps if each side spent a little more time learning about the other's culture, 200 years of war could have been avoided. But that's just a thought. The first crusade started in November of 1095, when Urban II uh, called on Christians to take up arms and regain control of the Holy Land from the Muslims. This was a battle that the Byzantines and Christians from Eastern Europe were already fighting. The call to reclaim the Holy Land was met with a flood of support. Knights and soldiers were willing to give their lives for the church. The first crusade had begun. Okay. A lot of, lot of details kind of glossed over here, though. So, like they were saying, though, the Byzantine Empire had, uh, and, and and Byzantine Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, had already split itself off officially. You had the Great Schism about 50 years before this, which was the official split and recognition of the split between what will now be seen as Orthodox Christianity and, uh, and, and Catholicism. And so you had that split. Um, but... You know, the 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 emperor, Alexios, he appealed to the Pope, Pope Urban II, saying, hey, let's unify as Christians, ask the people out in Western Europe to come join us because we're getting our butts kicked and that sort of thing. And the Pope, uh, a lot of people say, was definitely motivated by hoping to reestablish some, maybe some kind of authority over the East there. And they talked about how they, it, it, it talked right there about how, um, you know, you have these different faiths, right? Faith motivated, um, I don't know, intervention in this in this in this conflict here, um, and but they're they're I'm trying to say they're basically the same. They don't they don't view these groups don't view each other the same. It's like, hey, you have the same God and all this stuff. I know. I mean, when the Pope when Pope Urban put out his letter, which you can read, it's very short, uh, put out his basically letter to be sent out to all of christianity really in the west um it it talked about how yeah they're basically pagans and demon worshipers and stuff like that so they did not view each other that way which is what they said here they thought they were very different people um doing things in a very different way four main armies were formed led by raymond of saint gilles godfrey of bouillon hugh of vermandois and bohemond of toronto right. in august of 1096 they began marching to the holy land there's also a ragtag bunch of less organized people that left for the Holy Land. Just so you got like Raymond Toulouse, Peter. Uh, 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 sorry, going back, I always forget. forget. Raymond Godfrey and uh, uh, Bowman. They have these different armies, and they diff- they took different routes uh, by uh, or different routes through to to get to from Western Europe to um, the Holy Land itself. Which, by the way, was an incredible journey. I mean, it's like traveling from California to New York. Um, all along the way, I remember there's different types of people here. There are, I mean, some of them are, are even peasants and stuff. You've got nobles, and that journey was treacherous, and a lot of people didn't even survive that. And just imagine how devastating that was to to march literally like march across a continent, and then have to have the energy, resources, and stuff to fight an army that is established in this land and is highly trained and uh, is waiting for you. Right? Very difficult. Marching to the Holy Land. There's also a ragtag bunch of less organized people that left for the Holy Land just before the main armies. They could not contain their desire to take back what was rightfully Christian land. This disorganized army was called the People's Crusade and was led by a popular preacher of the time known as Peter the Hermit. Peter ignored the advice of well-trained generals and knights that suggested he wait for the main forces to arrive. Instead, Peter led his People's Crusade into Muslim territory and his entire army was crushed by Turkish forces at Sibothus. It was a humiliating defeat and senseless waste of life. When- what, what a lot of people like to say is the difference between this conflict before, because the Byzantine, yeah, the Byzantine Empire had lost this territory, um, and the, and 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 before this, before the people really say it's about the Turks. It's the Turks, because up to this point, um, Christian pilgrims had 
been able to basically freely move into the Holy Land, go to the sites and all that. And a lot of that was, you know, by by uh, Islamic groups that had come and gone through here. That was good business. I mean, having these Christians come from Europe, they come in, they visit all the sites, they spend money, they trade. It was a good thing. And so a lot of people say that the difference, though, is when the Seljuk Turks took over um, the region, um, specifically where where these these pilgrimage routes came and that there was more hostility towards that and that's what the byzantine empire was using as a a uh kind of like a um a, a call to arms that cr christian pilgrims are being massacred here and stuff like that when that wasn't the case um in centuries leading up to this when the main armies reached constantinople alexius i the emperor of the byzantine empire at the time declared that the crusader leaders must swear an oath of loyalty to him and recognize his authority over any lands they conquer. Mm. All of the leaders of the armies resisted this order except for Godfrey of Bouillon. Because, yeah, they're, what the emperor is afraid is they're going to do this and then just establish themselves. They're going to go rogue. They're going to set up their own kingdoms here or at the very, maybe at the very least, pledge more loyalty to the Pope because a lot of these people are they're Catholics coming out here. Some of, are just, some of them are just people looking for some kind of, uh, they're looking for <laughs> adventure, for land, for loot and all that. When the emperor is like, no, we're reconquering this for my empire. And that was something we find out in the Crusades. Everybody had different motivations. And this idea of doing it for a unified Christianity, that was never a thing. That, that never happened. The Crusaders felt that the land claimed during this holy war belonged to the victors, not an emperor who hid behind the walls of the city. Right. It was clear that Alexius and the Crusaders from the west would need to combine forces in order to reclaim the holy land from Muslim control. Absolutely. So a compromise was made. The Byzantine and Western European armies marched into Muslim territory and attacked Nicaea. They laid siege to the city, which surrendered to the Crusader forces in late June of 1097. Tensions were still high between the Crusaders and their Byzantine allies, but they continued on knowing that the only way they could secure their next victory of capturing the Syrian city of Antioch was by working together. Control of Antioch was necessary in order for the Crusaders to continue on to their main goal, Jerusalem. So you got, I mean, if you individualize the map, you got Constantinople, which is kind of like base camp for the Crusades. Um, but that's a long way still from the Levant region, um, the Holy Land in in, around, in and around Jerusalem. So these first battles, um, yeah, they, they notice that they, they have to unify. These are enemies that are well entrenched and um, it's big. There's a bunch of battles involved in here. A lot of people think it's just Jerusalem. No, it's... There's a lot of cities around this area. The purpose of this holy war was to reclaim Jerusalem for Christendom. Anything less was a failure. The Battle of Antioch caused losses on both sides, but eventually the city fell to the Crusaders. They were still squabbling over the right to control the land with the Byzantines, Horribly but the goal was in sight. Bohemond, whose army had actually captured the city, claimed it for himself. However, Raymond of saint Gilles felt it should be given to the emperor. Yeah. Neither leader would come to an agreement. As a result, the rest of the Christian forces marched on toward Jerusalem, we already have while a problem. Bohemond and Raymond stayed in Antioch fighting with each other. The Crusaders finally reached their destination and invaded the city of Jerusalem. The Muslim forces repelled attack after attack like waves breaking on a fortified wall. Crusader numbers had been depleted from other battles prior to reaching Jerusalem. The Muslim governor of the city was sure he could hold Hi, out Sophia. until more forces arrived from Egypt. Due to I always have to talk about the Hagia Sophia when I the see The Muslim it. governor of the city was sure he could hold out Probably until... top five favorite buildings uh, built by Emperor Justinian, even though the site, I mean, it kind of had been established by Constantine. Uh, but Justinian's up building it up, and then it becomes, it's the largest church in Christianity. It becomes kind of a, a centerpiece of that city. Of course, you can see it today because when the city eventually falls in 1453 to the Ottoman Turks, it gets uh, converted into a mosque. Well, more forces arrived from Egypt. Due Love to that lucky building. timing, the Crusaders received reinforcements before help for the Muslims could arrive. They erected siege towers and marched toward the walls of Jerusalem. The Crusader forces stormed the city and captured the governor, along with it. Wait, they're saying this is Jerusalem? High Sophia is in Constantinople. And that's what that building is. Uh, actually, no. This could not have been... Uh, <laughs> this actually could not be the highest Hagia Sophia if they were going for that because we got a historical anachronism here, you guys. You see these minarets... Okay, these are used for the call to prayer as part of the Pillars of Islam. <clears throat> and these were not erected um, until after Constantinople had fallen in 1453. So it looks like this today, but it would not have looked like this in the 11th century. And this wouldn't be Jerusalem either. <laughs> 
toward the walls of Jerusalem, did not exist in Jerusalem. The Crusader forces stormed the city and captured the governor, along with his army of bodyguards. After negotiations, they were escorted out of the city. The leaders of the Crusader force promised protection for the civilians of the city as they made preparations to leave. But the Christian soldiers disobeyed the order, yeah. or didn't know about the agreement at all, and slaughtered every Muslim and Jewish man, woman, and child in the name of their god. Once the carnage ceased... Yeah, and this, this was so bad, just violating general terms of, of wars and stuff like that. Um, because you end up... Yeah, so you see this slaughter of Muslims. Um, interestingly, in later crusades, like with Saladin, what you saw uh, was kind of the opposite, where they made a deal that people that wanted to leave the city could do so escorted and peacefully um, after the battle as part of the deal to basically uh, um, uh, save the people, right? As Saladin's army later on, um, Third Crusade and, or uh, yeah, uh, um, later on Crusades. It's not this one. This is the first Crusade, but later on, later Crusades, they would make these deals for um, the inhabitants of the cities. But this has kind of gone down as a black eye you know, for slaughtering the civilians needlessly, the, the the battles are done. The dust settled, the Crusaders had finally attained their goal. Three years after they left Europe for the Holy Land, Jerusalem was now under Christian control. After the completion of the First Crusade, many knights and soldiers returned home to their families and estates. Lots in states. order to control the Holy Land, four Crusader states were formed in Jerusalem, right. Edessa, Antioch, and Tripoli. It was in these lands that gigantic castles and fortresses were built in order to stave off any attacks from the enemy. However, in 1130, Muslim forces started to gain back territory during their own holy war, or Jihad. The Christians knew they were in trouble when General Zanki, governor of Mosul, besieged and captured Edessa. The fall of the northernmost crusader state was a cause for alarm across Christendom. This led to the church to call for another crusade to retake the territory that had been lost in the Holy Land. Right. This would lead to the start of the Second Crusade in 1147, led by King Louis VII of France and King Conrad III of Germany. Unlike the First Crusade, the Second had more than one objective. While King Louis VII and Conrad III marched to reclaim Edessa, other crusaders were sent to Spain to eradicate the Muslim threat in the region. So you, you kind of see what these objectives are shown here. The Crusades are becoming less and less about fighting for religious lands, and it's becoming more of a traditional war of expansion, um, imperialism, that sort of thing. And and the groups in these next Crusades, again, these are some of these are a generation later, are less and less motivated by that. A lot of people say the First Crusade, at least from the, the Christian perspective, was more about religious conviction than all the other ones after. Because the First Crusade is basically the only one the Christians were successful and all the other ones end up being failures. And, but what happened in that first one was it ended up being quite profitable for those that survived and stuff. They got established new kingdoms, um, all kinds of wealth. And I think for people back in Europe, when they heard about this, they were like, Hey, this isn't just some religious thing. There's actually like some temporal benefits, you know, for, for a peasant or for uh, that's, that's trying to get out of their life or even a noble that is competing with their family for uh, being able to have uh, uh, land rights and stuff like this. They saw that the Crusades could offer that. And we're probably assuming in these other Crusades that it would be easy, right? It would be easy. God was on their side or maybe the uh, these Islamic foes were inferior or something like that. But these people in these other Crusades are going to learn the hard way. That is not going to be the case going forward. At the same time, another force was sent to the Baltic Sea to wage war against the pagans that lived along the coast. During the Crusades, several religious That's military orders were created to aid pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land. The two most powerful of these orders were the Hospitallers and the Knights Templar. Both of the orders were composed of knights who fought solely in the name of God, and with God behind them amassed vast amounts of wealth and power. The Templar's headquarters was at the former Temple of Solomon, one of the most holy sites in all Jerusalem. These religious orders of knights gained control of and built castles along main travel routes, which allowed them to protect and support pilgrims on their journey to the Holy Land. These strategic outposts also allowed the religious orders to gain wealth and power, For as sure. they provided more and more services to the crusaders and pilgrims. Their foothold... Crusades, uh, traders, business people found a way to profit off of the crusades. I mean, there was so much money spent in the passage of these people across a continent and outfitting them. And again, it's controlling trade routes and that stuff that uh, business thrive from that. It's specifically why Italy, for example, becomes 
pretty much the wealthiest place in Europe because that everybody kind of passed through that's where they got on ships where they got materials and all that and the Italian city states made a fortune off of it and a lot of that money later on by the way uh, that is going to be now gener generational wealth created in Italy um, some of that's going to be used for things like the Renaissance Gold in the Holy Land and in Europe made them international organizations and their services were sought after by the kings and the church to help with battling the Muslim threat. These religious orders became so powerful that the church soon became jealous and wary of the organizations. This would eventually lead to their yeah. demise. In the Holy Land, the Muslims were gaining more and more ground. Louis and Conrad managed to reach Jerusalem just in time. They amassed an army of around 50,000 men. This was the largest crusader force of the war. In order to make their intentions and their power known, Louis and Conrad marched on the Syrian stronghold of Damascus with their massive force. However, the Muslim leaders began to unify and combine armies, realizing the only way to defeat the Christians was with cooperation of their own. Yeah, when people don't understand that too, that they think of the, the Islamic army as like, it's this one entity, the Muslim. Not true at all. Just like there's this division, incredible amounts of division and different motivations uh, for Christians, same thing was happening in uh, among um, among Muslims. You had like Sunni groups and Shia groups. Sometimes they had a hard time unifying. So just like there was division in the Christian side of things, on the Islamic side of things, uh, Muslim side of things, same thing was happening. Both sides had to overcome these divisions and unify um, despite whatever differences they have. When the army of crusaders reached Damascus, the Muslim forces had already joined together. Their large numbers, along with having the fortresses of the city as a fallback position, led to the Muslims pulverizing the Christian army. This defeat brought an abrupt end to the Second Crusade. Although the Christians Did still maintained well. control of much of the region gained during the First Crusade, their enemy was becoming powerful and the kingdoms of Europe were beginning to lose their grasp over the Holy Land. The Crusaders tried again and again to launch campaigns from Jerusalem further into Muslim territory. Their goal was to eventually capture Egypt, but they could not break the Muslim forces. In 1187, Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, launched his own campaign against the Crusader states. His goal was to reclaim Jerusalem for the Muslim faith, and he did. I mean, Saladin, again, comes through, uh, through Egypt. He was on a much grander war than just the Crusades. I mean, he was, he was trying to unify everything around there. He was, you know, again, taking Egypt and then going into more like the southern Levant. And it was later on, he was on a conquest much, much bigger than just the Holy Land. Just that, Saladin led his forces into Christian territory where he crushed their main army at the Battle of Hattin. Saladin successfully took Jerusalem and a large amount of territory surrounding it. The loss of Jerusalem resonated through Christendom, which led to the Third Crusade. This, this is where King Richard the Lionheart entered history. He along with- This is the famous, this is kind of the famous one that you see portrayed a lot more. Um, because again, you got Saladin, you got um, Richard Lionheart. So this is this is like a, a really famous one. A lot of movies and stuff come after this one. The other kings of Europe amassed another crusader army and marched toward the Holy Land to reclaim the city of Jerusalem once again. Once in the Holy Land, Richard the Lionheart and his forces roared into battle. They fought and defeated Saladin at the Battle of Arsuf. This was the main and only real battle of the Third Crusade. It was a decisive victory for the Christians. After Richard recaptured the city of Jaffa, he reestablished Christian control in the region. He took his crusaders and moved on to Jerusalem. Once there, he refused to lay siege on the holy city. Instead, in September of 1192, Richard and Saladin signed a peace treaty ending the Third Crusade and reestablishing the kingdom of Jerusalem. The Fourth Crusade was unlike all the <laughs> others. Instead of Christians fighting Muslims, Christians fought Christians. It was a strange time to be a crusader. Pope Innocent III called for a new crusade in 1198. So this, uh, this is the self-owned one. This is the this is the really embarrassing one from the Christian perspective, where they don't even make it to the Holy Land before they start fighting each other uh, in Constantinople. It's hilariously tragic. But a power struggle between Europe and Byzantium diverted the Crusaders from the Holy Land, and they headed to Constantinople to overthrow Alexius III. The plan was to replace him with his nephew, who would submit his power to Rome and the Catholic Church. When Alexius IV was put on the throne as Emperor of Byzantium by the Crusaders, he tried to force the Byzantine Church to rejoin the Western Church in Rome. This was met with intense resistance, and the new Emperor was strangled to death during a coup in 1204. This caused the Crusaders to declare full-out war on Constantinople, and they sacked the city. 
The Fourth Crusade concluded with the fall of Constantinople. They're sacking the largest city in Christianity. This is no longer about religion. It, it was barely at the beginning, but now by the Fourth Crusade, it's definitely not. This has always been about, now, this is about mercenary work. Noble. The Crusaders slaughtered hundreds and looted everything they could get their hands on. The entire Byzantine capital was practically destroyed. This crusade against the Byzantine Empire created an everlasting schism between the Eastern and Western churches. After the sack of Constantinople and the end of the Fourth Crusade, there was a series of smaller crusades. None of them would amass the armies or reclaim territory in the same way the previous wars had. There was also a shift in ideology during these final crusades. The emphasis was not on reclaiming the Holy Land from Muslim forces, but on decimating anyone seen as a threat to the Catholic faith. For example, the Albigensian Crusade's sole purpose was to wipe out the Cathari sect of Christianity in France. The Baltic Crusade's main purpose was to eradicate the pagans in Transylvania. These crusades had nothing to do with maintaining control of the Holy Land, yep. and instead focused on the genocide of groups of people who did not conform to the Catholic ideology. Then there was the Children's Crusade, where thousands of people vowed to march to Jerusalem and make a life in the Holy Land. This was not really a crusade since the motley crew that made up the group were children, adolescents, women, elderly it's people, migration. and the poor. This group never actually reached Jerusalem, and therefore the Children's Crusade is a bit of a misnomer. The Crusades lasted hundreds of years and resulted in the loss of countless lives. The battles resulted in the destruction of important cultural and religious structures and artifacts on both sides. In 1291, the city of Acre fell to Muslim forces, marking what many believed to be the end of the Crusades. The legacy of all this death and destruction was the dismantling of the Byzantine Empire, noble houses of Europe gaining large amounts of power and wealth, and myths of religious heroes spreading throughout the lands. However, the actual goal of the Crusades, which was to take back the Holy Land and hold it in the name of Christianity, was not actually achieved. Now, right. check out the fall of Constantinople, or watch mm. Medieval Knights were not noble, but cold-hearted killers. Ooh, I like both of those topics. Love learning about the fall of Constantinople and how important it is. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah, you nailed it. It's becoming less and less about the religious stuff. More about, well, everything else. All right, so they chose the Crusades as the most brutal war in history. Again, is that necessarily the case? I mean, it's it's definitely memorable, Yeah, no doubt. But again, it's this large string of relatively unconnected events over a couple hundred years but yeah i mean you can see it as a larger conflict um yeah for sure now crusades is usually what a lot of people like to cite when you want to talk about religious uh, religions and how they can influence warfare right about the negative sides of religion how religion can be used to justify slaughters and war and all this stuff so that's kind of what people love to throw at and just to give an example of brutality amongst many different types of uh, religious groups throughout history you know the crusades is often uh, cited for that but like they said too it's also been completely romanticized as uh, in on, on both sides of things uh, you have these noble devout people that become heroes as a result of the crusades but it's important to understand, and they, they talked about this too, is that, you know, that that is an argument that people will like to make, that it's purely motivated by religious conviction. These are just devout, God-serving people, but there are so many other things to this, right? Some people say that was an excuse of trying, uh, an excuse, right, to make themselves look better and to make their heroic people look better, when in the end, this is the same kind of brutality that happens in any war. Right, so I think that's important when you you look at the Crusades as um, a multifaceted, uh, um, diverse thing that happened for lots of different reasons over a long period of time, and uh, keep it vague like that for the most part. Anyway, I know a lot of people love learning about the Crusades again because it has become so romanticized. Um, so I think you can always be learning about it, and each again Crusade has its own neat kind of stories and actions and and events that kind of surround it. So it's kind of neat to do that. And I think that's important to break it up into those pieces there. Um, last thing I was going to say about this was the Crusades end up being a disaster for the Christian West and the fact that they were never able to retake these lands. They had very little success. Um, and also it began the downfall of 
the Byzantine Empire. Um, the Byzantine Empire will never recover from the Fourth Crusade. That that sack on Constantinople by other Christians, they never recover from. And 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 Constantinople has been sieged and attacked many times, and it's and it's a thousand years before it was turned over to the Ottoman Turks. Uh, but they will never recover from this. Um, they never do. And it's from this point on that the empire, just in general will lose its ground and eventually become nothing after 1453 and Constantinople's finally fallen, which was the only remnant of the Byzantine Empire even left by that point. So in the end, great way to sum up the Crusades is, well, from the Christian perspective, as epic fail. All right, guys, and with that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.